Chapter 7 I remember nothing of my flight except the stress of blundering against trees and stumbling through the heather. I came into the road between the crossroads and Horshaw, near the bridge that crosses the canal by the gasworks. Exhausted, I staggered, fell by the wayside and lay still. I must have remained there some time. When I sat up, I felt strangely perplexed. For a moment, I could not clearly understand how I came there. My terror had fallen from me like a garment. I was immediately my everyday self again, a decent, ordinary citizen. The silent common, my flight, the flames, were as if they had been in a dream. I asked myself, had these things happened? I rose and walked unsteadily up the steep incline of the bridge. My mind was blank. My muscles and nerves seemed drained of their strength. I staggered drunkenly. Over the Maybury Arch, a train, a long caterpillar of white firelit smoke and lighted windows, went flying south, and they had gone. A group of people taught by the gate of one of the pretty little row of houses called Oriental Terrace. It was all so real and so familiar. At times I suffer from the strangest sense of detachment from myself and the world about me. I seem to watch it all from the outside, out of the stress and tragedy of it all. Here was serenity, while swift death was not two miles away. At the gasworks, I stopped at the group of people. What news from the common, said I. There were two men and a woman at the gate. Huh? said one of the men, turning. What news from the common, I said. Ain't you just been there? asked the men. Haven't you heard of the men from Mars, said I. The creatures from Mars. Quite enough, thanks, said the woman over the gate. All three of them laughed. I felt foolish and angry. I tried and found I could not tell them what I had seen. They laughed again at my broken sentences. You'll hear more yet, I said, and went on to my home. I startled my wife at the doorway. So haggard was I. I went into the dining room, sat down and drank some wine. My dinner remained neglected on the table while I told my story. Poor Ogilvy, I said, to think he may be lying dead there. My wife's face was deadly white. They may come here, she said again and again. They can scarcely move, I said. I began to comfort her and myself by repeating all that Ogilvy had told me of the impossibility of the Martians establishing themselves on the earth. That, indeed, was the general opinion. Both the Times and the Daily Telegraph, for instance, insisted on it the next morning. They have done a foolish thing, said I. Perhaps they expected to find no living things, certainly no intelligent living things. If the worst comes to the worst, we will kill them all. I remember that dinner table with extraordinary vividness. My dear wife's sweet, anxious face peering at me from under the pink lampshade. The white cloth with its silver and glass table furniture. The crimson purple wine in my glass. I did not know it then, but that was the last civilised dinner I was to eat for very many strange and terrible days. Chapter 8 In this chapter, the narrator steps back from his own story to describe the immediate aftermath of the terrible events on Horshaw Common. In Woking Junction, until a late hour, trains were stopping and going on. Passengers were alighting and waiting. Everything was proceeding in the most ordinary way. The ringing impact of trucks, 
the sharp whistle of the engine from the junction, mingled with their shouts of, Men from Mars! Excited men came into the station about nine o'clock with incredible tidings and caused no more disturbance than drunkards might have done. Train passengers heading towards London peered into the darkness outside the carriage windows. They saw only a rare, flickering, vanishing spark dance up from the direction of Horsell. A red glow and a thin veil of smoke driving across the stars. They thought that nothing more serious than a heath fire was happening. It was only round the edge of the common that any disturbance was perceptible. There were half a dozen villas burning on the Woking border. Now and again a light ray, like the beam of a warship's searchlight, swept the common. That big area of common was silent and desolate. The charred bodies lay about on it all night under the stars and all the next day. A noise of hammering from the pit was heard by many people. In the centre, sticking into the skin of our old planet Earth like a poison dart, was this cylinder. But the poison was scarcely working yet. Around the cylinder was a patch of silent common, smouldering in places and with a few dark, dimly seen objects lying in contorted attitudes. Here and there was a burning bush or tree. In the rest of the world, the stream of life still flowed. All night long, the Martians were hammering and stirring, sleepless and indefatigable, at work upon the machines they were making ready. And ever and again, a puff of greenish-white smoke whirled up to the starlit sky. About eleven, a company of soldiers came through Horshaw and deployed around the edge of the common to form a cordon. A few seconds after midnight, the crowd saw a star fall from heaven into the pine woods to the northwest. It had a greenish colour and caused a silent brightness, like summer lightning. This was the second cylinder.